here with uh, James D'Eugenio. He is the publisher at Kennedy'sandKing.com and the author of The JFK Assassination, The Evidence Today. Thank you, Jim, for, for, for talking to us. Okay, you're welcome, David. Uh, we got a KPFA interview from 1966 with Penn Jones Jr. Uh, he's talking about his first book. And Jim, you had a chance to listen to it. I wonder if you could tell us uh, a little bit about Penn Jones and, and the work that he did on the assassination. That, that was actually a pretty interesting interview. See, Penn Jones is one of these guys from Texas who actually bought a weekly newspaper before the assassination. And he talks about it in that interview. All right. He had owned it for a year or two before the assassination. It had been firebombed. All right. And I don't know if he makes his connection, but he had refused to do a printing for this right wing, right wing group uh, that I think was led by one of the Texas police officers, Mr. Butler, all right? And because they were associated with the extreme right, the Klan and the John Birch Society, all right? And Penn did not really find that all attractive, even though he would have made a lot of money if he would have done the printing assignment for him, all right? Now, one of the things that Penn talks about also in there is the difference between how many people have read the Warren Report versus how many people have read the 26 volumes, which of course is the commission, what they call the testimony and exhibits. Because as he notes in there, if you read the testimony and exhibits, you'll see that it does not match up with what's in the 888-page Warren Report. Unfortunately, not very many people want to read the testimony exhibits because it's about 17,000 or 18,000 pages in, that, uh, in those 26 volumes, all right? Uh, Penn also talks about, I think it's an interesting question he's talking about here, is when he talks about the difference in the books coming out at around this time and how they differ from the stuff that was being written back in 1964. If you recall in 1964, when the Warren Report first came out, there were not really that many voices, okay, that were talking about the problems with the evidence, okay, at that time. There was maybe Mark Lane in The Guardian Stoughton Lind in the New Republic. And I think there was also um, a column um, by the French writer whose name I can't recall right now. Look, yeah, Louis Savage, okay. And that was really about it at that time. What happened, of course, is that some people actually did read the 26 volumes, all right? And in one case, Edward Epstein, he actually had access to a lot of the people who actually worked on the Warren Commission, especially Wesley Liebler, all right? And so in his book, Inquest, which came out in 1966, that book sort of took you inside the Warren Commission and how it worked. And it showed you um, how a hierarchy all right, can essentially veto the wishes of the people working under it. Because in that book, for example, they, he shows how certain lawyers on the commission did not want to include some of the most controversial witnesses that ended up in the Warren Commission report, like Howard Brennan, and Helen Markham, the lower level, what they call junior counsel, objected to including them in the Warren Report. Uh, Wesley Liebler for one, Joseph Ball for another one. Wesley Liebler in his famous memorandum, the, we the Liebler memorandum, said it was a nice try trying to bury Helen Markham, but I predict she will not be hidden for long. Okay, and then Joseph Ball at a, 
uh, a debate, I think, in Long Beach. All right. He called her, quote, an utter screwball. All right. So in other words, there were people inside the Warren Commission who understood that the critics were going to have an open season on some of the people they decided to use. And of course, that happened with Mark Lane. Because Mark Lane, he came out with his book, Rush to Judgment, and he went after both of those people, okay, showing what unreliable witnesses that they actually were, all the serious problems that they exposed, all right? So his approach was really different in that his approach, as opposed to Epstein's, Lane's approach was really a textual analysis of the 26 volumes, all right? That's how long it took to actually read those 17,000 words. So he went after the evidence, the evidence itself, all right? Um, Harold Weisberg had the same approach, all right, uh, except the difference was Lane actually interviewed a lot of people in Dallas for Rush to Judgment. He actually went down there with the filmmaker Emil D'Antonio, all right, and they did an accompanying video to accompany the text, the, the actual book. Weisberg more or less relied on the 26 volumes, you know, for, for, for the evidence in which he decided that the, and of course, I don't say very much more than the title, it's called Whitewash. All right, so obviously he's saying that the Warren Commission was really more of a cover-up than it, it, it was an investigation. All right, now in Penn's books, um, forgive my grief, I think just came out at this time. And I believe they did three or four volumes of that. Penn Jones's book was a little bit different in that he was one of the few critics who actually inserted, and the interviewer notices this, long chunks of testimony, you know, to show how absurd the, uh, uh, the Warren Commission conclusions really were. All right. And another thing he did, and the interviewer noticed this also, he was one of the first to point out um, the rather odd occurrence of these, let's call them untimely deaths, and how this had put a fear into some of the witnesses. In the interview, he mentions Lee Bowers, you know, how his wife did not want to talk about uh, his death but she did say that he had been instructed not to talk to the public, although he did talk to Mark Lane, all right, for his video, all right. But I, I can tell you that other people encountered this very serious problem also. Um, Emil D'Antonio, when he was shooting the Rush to Judgment video with Lane, said he had never seen this kind of fear in any documentary film that he had done and he had done one on McCarthy. Okay. And he had, and he did one on Vietnam. All right. Uh, yeah, I think it was called year of the pig. All right. And he said, I never encountered so many frightened witnesses as I did in shooting that film with Mark Lane. Never. All right. Uh, and he talked a little bit about Helen Markham, uh, how she was afraid to even come outside of her door. All right, this is the person that the Warren Commission used to make their case for Oswald uh, killing Tippett. All right, and we got that also from Vincent Salandria, who's another guy who went down to Dallas, I believe in the summer of 1964. And he told me more or less the same thing, that somebody he thought was a Dallas police, you know, was intimidating these witnesses. And I have it from a third source also. Okay, um, a report journalist who tried to interview some of the people working at Texas School Book Depository. All right. And he said that the Dallas police in, essentially wrote him out of town. Okay, when he started talking to somebody, some of the people uh, who worked at the Texas School Book Depository. All right. So that's another theme that he hits upon. And see, the thing is, the thing is, because he lived 25 miles away and because he began, see, Penn Jones 
I believe was the first guy to actually begin what he called the annual vigil, okay, in which he would go ahead, drive up to Dallas, all right, and stage a commemoration for Kennedy's death on every November 22nd, 1963. And over time, over time, as this went on in the 1966, 1967, when the big controversy is hitting the airwaves, all right, uh, this began to attract some attention. And I'm not just talking about other people in Dallas. I'm talking about some of the, uh, if you can believe it, some of the mainstream press now began going down there. Penn Jones actually met up with Martin Waldron from the New York Times, okay, at the uh, November 22nd, 1966 commemoration. And Waldron had a lot of questions for him, all right? And this shows, by the way, the very fact that that happened shows that the mainstream media, contrary to what they said, was very interested in the JFK case. And what Penn said at that time was that a lot of the questions that Waldron had for him dealt with New Orleans, okay? And by the way, same thing with Life Magazine, all right? Their investigation, when it got into New Orleans, began to sputter, all right, and be sidetracked. All right, because there are a lot of connecting interesting parts in the whole New Orleans nexus of the Kennedy assassination. All right, so that's another thing Penn did. Penn started those annual commemorations that go on until this very day. Now, another thing that Penn brings up in this interview that I found to be quite interesting is the death of Dorothy Kilgallen, all right? Um, Dorothy Kilgallen was, of course, one of the very, very few MSM, we would call them today, reporters for a big newspaper. I think it was a New York Journal American. All right. And she made no bones about how interested she was in the Kennedy assassination. She actually wrote a few columns there about the JFK case. All right. And as he mentions in the interview, during the Jack Ruby trial, which she covered, because she was very interested in high profile murder cases. Uh, for instance, she covered the Sam Shepard murder trial also. All right. And so she went down and her editor let her go down there and cover the Jack Ruby trial. And I'm pretty sure she's the only person was allowed to get a private interview with Ruby, okay? And also get an interview with the judge, okay, during that trial. And there was a very good article, a long article about her death. It was in the Midwest Book Review. And you can Google that. And it's a very good article about the odd circumstances around Dorothea Kilgallen's strange death, all right? Um, and she was supposedly, from the word of the people who were around her, okay, she was going to take a trip to New Orleans, okay, uh, at around the time, I think she died in 1966. Her biographer, Lee Israel, there were a lot of interesting things that she cut from her biography of Kilgallen, all right? And th these are mentioned in that Midwest book review. Uh, that's about 20 pages long. A guy named Ron Pataki, all right, who she found to be rather suspicious, all right? And so um, it's, it's very interesting that, that he's on to that the whole Dorothy Kilgallen angle this early in the case. Okay, that's, that's really speaks well, you know, for, for Penn Jones, because this is something, of course, that people still have not actually gotten onto, okay, that, that the Kilgallen death was both 
very interesting in its circumstances and also probably important uh, to the case itself. Now, Penn was in an interesting position because he had bought this newspaper, the Midlothian Mirror, okay, in this small town, all right? And he was the editor and publisher of that newspaper. So in other words, he didn't have to answer to anybody. And so he, it was a weekly newspaper, which he brought out. I met his wife once and she told me how they worked together on it, okay? And Penn almost always insisted on putting at least one article in there about the JFK case, all right? And uh, he was really, I can't think of another person who did, who did that. There was no newspaper in America that did what Penn, you know, usually it was the other way around. The, the, the major newspapers frowned on anything relating to the JFK case. All right. Now, Penn Jones was also, if you, I think most people listening to this show will understand. Once the Jim Garrison investigation went public in February of 1967, very soon after that, the critics were split about their feelings about Garrison. Okay. You had people who, were vociferous, vociferously against him, like Sylvia Marr and Paul Hoke, uh, Peter Dell Scott, Tink Thompson, all right? And then you had other people who were for him, like uh, Ray Marcus, uh, Mark Lane, and Penn Jones was another one, all right? Penn Jones never lost faith in Jim Garrison. And there was an interesting exchange of letters between Penn Jones and Sylvia Marr over this dispute. It's in John Callan's very good book, Praise from a Future Generation, which details the lives of the early critics from about 1965 to about 1968. Penn Jones never lost his loyalty to Jim Garrison. And I think that also speaks very well of Penn. And by the way, I have to say this, he never lost his interest in this case, okay, up until when he died, okay? He was still active in this case, all right? And, and you know, the JFK, I've, I've learned the hard way. The JFK case is not a winner, okay, <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, all right? I mean, it even hurts somebody as big as Oliver Stone, Right. You know, it, uh, it did, if you talk to him, he'll tell you that that it, uh, JFK did not help his career. It actually hurt his career. All right. Because he was attacked so vociferously. I think we all remember that. I mean, you know, if you were around in 1991, the attacks on Oliver Stone began six or seven months before the picture ever premiered in the theaters. All right. But Penn Jones was on this case for Oh my God, three decades. All right. It didn't, it did, of course, it didn't help him. It didn't help his newspaper. It didn't help him financially or anything like that. But he's, but I have to admire the, the guy's guts and perseverance. One last thing I want to say about Penn. In addition to the Midlothian mirror, okay, in addition to his books, he published one of the most distinguished. JFK research journals uh, that I think ever existed, okay? And this was called the Continuing Inquiry, mm. right? And if you want to read some good writing, and I think it was from the 70s and the 80s, that collection, you can read it online at the Mary Farrell Foundation. That website has the past issues. And you will see some very good writing from people who were still interested in the JFK case. Penn edited that, okay, contributed some of the articles himself, all right? And it had some of the, the best writers from that era, like Ed Tatro, for example, out of Massachusetts, all right? 
So that's another contribution that this guy made to this case. Okay, I mean, Penn Jones, you, you've got to really consider when, when you take a look at him, you know, and everything he tried to do in this case, you know, uh, which, did, like I said, did not benefit him, him in any way. Fame, money, fortune, and anything, forget it. All right, but he did it and he kept his nose to the grindstone. All right, even though it hurt him probably. And there, there's, there's at least one article by Ron Rosenbaum in the Texas Monthly that actually went after Penn Jones. This is what I mean. Okay, the, the big guns of the media, all right, will go after you if you stay on this case too long. You know, that got Ron Rosenbaum uh, a spot on Nightline with Ted Koppel, okay? In which he was, in, in Texas Monthly has been just horrible on the JFK case forever, all right? There's essentially the Texas establishment. Penn Jones, by the way, one very last thing. I believe that those annual commemorations, okay, that he had, which got bigger and bigger as time went on. I believe that what happened there is that he kind of forced the power elite in Dallas to face the fact that Dealey Plaza was their number one tourist site. That people were just going there month after month, year after year, because they wanted to see the place where John F. Kennedy was killed, okay? You know, and I think Penn helped contribute to that until finally they decided that, okay, we're going to have to take control of this situation. All right. And so then I think in, in, I think late 89 or something like that, they decided they were going to construct the sixth floor museum. Okay. Out of the old Texas school book depository. That's the kind of impact <laughs> that one guy had, Penn Jones, okay, on this case. All right, a, a very admiral person, and this is a good interview. I'm William O'Connell, and we have in the studio with us today Penn Jones Jr., the author of a, a new book on the Kennedy assassination entitled Forgive My Grief. It's subtitled, A Critical Review of the Warren Commission Report on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Jones is here in California for a few days, and uh, this isn't my first opportunity to uh, talk with him. As a matter of fact, I didn't know him at all, uh, but um, I had read his book, and I happened to be in Houston on business just a few weeks ago, and having been an independent researcher on the case for a couple of years, I... I was very anxious to meet you, and as you may recall, I, I phoned you, and you were very cordial and appreciative of my interest, and uh, uh, then I came up uh, to Dallas, and uh, uh, Mr. Jones took me around the assassination site for two days, and we retraced uh, some of the uh, steps allegedly taken uh, or followed by Lee Harvey Oswald. We went to the Tippett site, and... Uh, this visit enabled me to make a photographic record for my own purposes of the of the site, and uh, I only wish I could have stayed longer. Um, we do too, Ben. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I notice in your book that you have an introduction by John Howard Griffin, and uh, he says a number of interesting things here. I wonder if I could, I, I want to lead up to a number of questions. He says, some few men in this country were not satisfied with these loose ends. He's referring to um, a number of loose ends with reference to uh, stories concerning the assassination. Yes. He continues, he said, some of these had obsessive theories and tried to make the loose ends arrange themselves in such a way as to prove these theories. They do not count for anything. Others, however, with a great dedication to truth, wherever it might lead them, have sought to resolve these loose ends for the sake of history and truth. They have devoted themselves to gathering, sifting, and re-examining evidence. They have sought to follow truth even when this has led them down roads that sickened and terrified them. Penn Jones belongs to this latter small group. Since that terrible day, he has dedicated himself to resolving the riddle, and he has followed authentic leads 
abandoned countless ones that turned out not to be authentic. He asks, is this wise to do this? I want to ask that question of you, Mr. Jones. Is it wise? And if so, why? Oh, I think it, uh, it may not be wise, but it's necessary, Bill. Uh, the people of the United States must be uh, aware of the things that went on in Dallas, the things that went on even before the assassination, and they must acquaint themselves with the testimony and the exhibits of the Warren Commission. You know, Bill, there have been less than uh, 2,000 sets of the testimony and exhibits sold now, in, these are, in the United States. Now, these are referring to the 26 volumes, Yes, aren't you? the 26 volumes. Certainly there were millions of copies of the report sold, and I'd say that thousands of people have read the report. But I dare say there are less than 500 people in the United States probably less than 200 people in the United States who have read a major portion of the testimony and the exhibits. It's very time-consuming. I know I have a set of my own, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's very demanding. Well, it's, it's true that there are 18,000 pages. There are over 10 million words, but uh, this democracy is worth that effort. This democracy is, is, is worth our, our dying for, if necessary, and uh, I think we must we must dig to the very bottom of this thing, well, regardless. Well, a number of people are now digging to the bottom, as you say, and uh, we have a spate of books on the Warren Commission report that are now appearing, and um, yours uh, came to me, as a matter of fact, uh, before the first of these, which I believe was uh, Inquest by Edward J. Epstein, and I read it, I read your book at that time, that was before I met you, and I've been looking through it again. Uh, one of the questions that many people ask uh, is, how responsible is the criticism that's now being leveled at the Warren Commission? Uh, some people construe it uh, as an attack upon the person of the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, how would you reply to that? Well... Bill, I'm a newspaper man. I own my own little weekly newspaper in Midlothian, Texas. Now, that's not in Dallas. It's 25 miles south of Dallas. Yes. And uh, I am trying as a newsman to do an honest job. I'm not sure that I always will uh, uh, give you give the truth, but uh, news stories are written in, uh, by human beings who sometimes make errors, but uh, America does deserve an honest job all the time, and I hope that uh, I uh, am doing that. Now, there, I think these books are very important that are coming out. Uh, I, I think Harold Weisberg's book, uh, Whitewash, is, is probably the best of the whole group, uh, including mine. That treats uh, in detail all or most of the material in the 26 volumes in yes, a very yes, thorough, searching way, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it's a very thorough job. Well, now, how do these books that are coming out now in the fall and winter of 1966, how do these books differ? How does the criticism differ, if, if it does in any way, from those uh, books and uh, articles that appeared... Uh, um, at the time the Warren Commission report was uh, was uh, published or, or immediately before its appearance? Well, Epstein, you know, is the only one that uh, actually interviewed uh, uh, members of the commission and, and staff. Uh, I think his book is important because he deals uh, with that aspect of the case that none of the rest of us have touched. Elaine is a man that has done uh, considerable work interviewing uh, witnesses in the Dallas area. My book, I feel, uh, I give the background on some of the uh, characters uh, in Dallas who were not witnesses but are still important uh, to this case. And then I also uh, am a, the one that has dealt in greatest detail with the peripheral deaths that have taken place uh, since the assassination. Yes. You know, and there are now 17 people who uh, had special knowledge or had the opportunity to have special knowledge, who have died, some of them have been murdered, others have died under questionable circumstances, and uh, I think they deserve to be more fully investigated by, by big newspapers who have adequate budgets and by uh, the people at large who, sh who must be Become acquainted with what's going on. Here. Yes, I noticed in your book, it seems to me it differs from uh, those uh, that have appeared so far, 
uh, to the degree that it publishes large segments of testimony from the 26 volumes. Uh, you have edited them, edited them to some degree, but you, you do present large chunks of testimony uh, from a number of people that uh, I think that we, we might have overlooked or that the other books have not treated. I mean, just looking at your, your chapter titles here, you first start out with a meeting at Ruby's apartment, and the second chapter is George Senator. Uh, then you have a chapter on Kilgallen, Cantor, and Armstrong. And uh, Bertha Cheek, who was the sister, I believe, of uh, Earl Roberts, Roberts, Oswald's landlady. You have a chapter on uh, Jesse Curry, the Dallas chief of police. And uh, I, I, I think that this book uh, deals, therefore, with, uh, it seemed to me in reading it, that you're dealing with, you're not dealing with the ballistics evidence of the case. You're not dealing with the number of shots or the shells found or the angle of trajectory of, of fire or where the shots uh, could have come from. It seems to me that you're, you're dealing with uh, a fascinating area. It's fascinating to me to read, and uh, I must say it's a little disturbing because it goes into an area uh, that the commission apparently, um, in its final report, didn't seek to dwell. They confined themselves to other points, and uh, you've brought out uh, some fascinating testimony that I want to ask you about. But returning to this question of responsibility and criticism, I notice that one of the uh, uh, distinguished uh, members of the California bar, Paul Fries, has written in the New York uh, University Law Review of the Warren Commission that, it's, uh, that it was vulnerable because its real task was not to find the truth, but to have appeared to have found the truth. Is that an accurate statement? Mr. Freeze, incidentally, agrees with the findings of the commission, but uh, he made that uh, stricture on their work. Well, I certainly don't think that they found the truth. Uh, I think it would have been, they, they may have gotten away with it had they not printed the 3,000 sets of testimony and exhibits. And the reason that I have printed in my book large chunks of the testimony is to let the American public see some of the amazing things that some of these witnesses said. And many of those amazing things uh, the commission passed over without even a question, without even batting an eye. Uh, some of these witnesses would uh, tell the commission, for example, give them a, a wrong address of maybe two or three miles in Dallas, and the commission would go blithely on just like uh, it didn't matter which part of town they were talking about. Yes. Uh, the testimony of Henry Wade uh, is that of a bumbling, uh, almost uh, illiterate uh, country lawyer, but uh, Wade is the, not that type of lawyer. When you hear him now on an interview, and uh, he's, uh, he's coherent, and uh, he's, he knows what his subject is, and he gets it across to the people uh, in a did professional he present manner. A, did, did he present a picture of himself to the Warren Commission that uh, doesn't correspond to the man you know in Dallas today? Yes, or? I was in law school with him, and uh, uh, I'm one of those who did not graduate from law school, but I was in law school with him, and I know that he's not the type of bungling man that that you read in his testimony in the exhibits. One gets the feeling uh, in reading your book and uh, on the basis of the selection that you've made of the testimony that um, that there was a kind of connivance um, on the part of the Dallas police or a kind of involvement in the assassination. Um, uh, how would you characterize it? Am, am, am I accurate in saying that? What is your... Yes, I, that's, that's an accurate evaluation of what I was trying to do. I think when, when the most important uh, prisoner in history is... Uh, while handcuffed to a policeman with 70 other policemen hanging around, and then that prisoner is killed in the jail by one of the uh, police uh, flunkies, by a hanger-on, by a man that was known to all of the police, by a man that, uh, that licked the boots of the police in order to stay in business, I think we must uh, conclude that... Uh, that uh, the police were involved, and I tried to point out some of the uh, people that I feel uh, yes, you have are a, involved with the police. You have a chapter, um, I, I believe it's uh, 
Thayer Walder was the witness uh, testifying before the Warren Commission. Um, and he's being interrogated by one of the counsel. Uh, in the book, uh, he speaks of the phlegmatic poise of a Lieutenant Butler uh, through the uh, first two or three days of the assassination, that is, on Friday and Saturday. But uh, on Sunday, uh, the day that uh, Ruby uh, shot Oswald, he loses uh, what, uh, what Waldo calls this phlegmatic poise. Uh, you deduce something from this. Uh, I wonder if you'd go into that. Well, us. Waldo was a, a working newsman that day. You see, I was a, an invited newsman to the luncheon that day and did not have... You were, at, you were waiting at the trademark. I right? was waiting at the trademark with, with hundreds of other newsmen who were invited guests and not working newsmen that day. So I did not cover the assassination or, or those two or three days. I, I spent most of my time crying, but uh, I have interviewed Waldo since, and I have read his testimony a half a dozen times. I went to Mexico City to interview him rather recently, and uh, Waldo told me that uh, although other people said they were in charge of security on this uh, fatal Sunday morning, Waldo said that Butler was in charge of security that morning, and that Butler's... Uh, bearing his attitude his his nervous condition that morning was indicative to Waldo that Butler knew something was fixing to take place and he lost he completely lost the stolid composure that he had presented to uh, Waldo from Friday at uh, two o'clock until this Sunday morning I see so that uh, uh, we feel that that Butler was one of the important witnesses that was not even called. He was not called. He was not called to testify in any way to the Warren Commission or give a deposition uh, on it. You had known of Butler uh, yes, I, in Midlothian, I, according to your book. Yes. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Butler came to Midlothian, which is a small town 25 miles out of Dallas. That's he, where you, you publish your, yes, your weekly newspaper. Yes. And he was down there speaking uh, in 1962, 1961, and possibly si late 61 and possibly 62, making uh, uh, John Birch type, type speeches. He's a member of the John Birch Society, and uh, uh, he came into my office on one of these visits down to Midlothian, and he certainly he knew nothing about me at that time. and. His object for visiting my shop was to see if I would print for uh, his group, and I don't know who that group is, but he wanted me to print a region-wide KKK newspaper. Hmm. Uh, here's, uh, here's a little weekly shop that's been struggling for 20 years trying to make ends meet, and then we have to turn down a big piece of commercial printing that would uh, have put us in good shape economically for quite a while. Well, hadn't you by then achieved some notoriety in Midlothian? I noticed that you were a recipient in 1963 of the Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award for Courage in Journalism. I believe that's given by the Southern Illinois University. What well, uh, that's true, uh, but this, this, this encounter with Butler was before oh, any of this happened. Uh, my place was firebombed in, in April of 1962, and this, that's when we uh, got national published. That's the first time anyone ever heard of uh, the little weekly editor from, uh, from Midlothian, Texas, and, and Southern Illinois University did give us the award uh, after that uh, incident. But the, the encounter with Butler was before any of this took place. Going from uh, from Butler, just a moment, going back to um, Ruby himself and the shooting of Oswald, uh, my feeling after reading the book is that you feel there's definitely a link between Ruby and Oswald, and I want to ask the question, in as much, the, as, in as much that uh, more than one of the leading critics on the case feels that there was no link, in other words, that no link is needed to prove a conspiracy, in the president's death, why do you feel uh, that there is a link? Is it necessary that there to have been a link between Ruby and Oswald? Well, I don't think it 
is necessary that there be a link, but I do think there was a link Why? between Ruby and Oswald. Well, in the book, I, I give the uh, deposition, or, or rather, I quote the letter, which is, uh, was sent to the FBI director by an attorney in, in uh, Dallas by the name of Carol Jarnigan. And Jarnigan, in this letter to uh, the FBI director, outlines a, a purported meeting that was uh, held between Ruby and Oswald in Ruby's Carousel Club. Uh, a good many people, the, the Warren Commission, did not call Carol Jarnigan as a witness. And uh, apparently, I don't know why they didn't call him, but uh, the only reason I can find in the testimony is that Henry Wade claims that uh, he had this attorney take a lie detector test. And from the lie detector test, Wade said that Jarnigan's uh, story was a pure fantasy. He said uh, Jarnigan thinks it happened, but it didn't really happen. Well, a number of people who've read the Jarnigan testimony wonder if, if he's if he's truly stable or or whether it can be well after all of the other on. kooks that the commission <laughs> uh, uh, called and listened to and believed uh, I think that uh, whether this man is a kook or not he should have been allowed to come and tell his story to the commission so that we all could maybe evaluate it and not rely upon the the lie detector techniques of the Dallas Police Department how many witnesses were not called to testify before the commission. I mean witnesses to the assassination. I think it would have run into the dozens. Uh, These people are accessible to you today, are they, many of them? <laughs> well, my feeling, you see, uh, after going and visiting you in Dallas and, and uh, traveling around somewhat, uh, was the feeling, I had a feeling that there was fertile ground for an, assass uh, for an, an investigation, an additional investigation of the assassination, people that might be able to yield up genuine information and that there were possible leads. I think many people said, well, at this date, so many clues have been watered over that it would be very difficult to gain access to people who uh, had something to say or were willing to talk. I didn't that's, feel that. No, and that's not there. true, Bill. I could keep, if I could afford it, I could keep two investigators busy in the Dallas area checking le legitimate leads that are still developing uh, in, in the city. Now, these people are reluctant. Many of them are frightened. Many of them refuse completely to have anything to do with you, and uh, that includes uh, uh, some, the widow of the, one of the most recent people who, to die who was a witness at the assassination site. Uh, who was that? That was uh, Lee Bowers was... Uh, an employee in the uh, railroad tower at the time of the assassination. And, yes. and he saw some unusual activities going on behind the wooden fence and, and wasn't uh, permitted or was interrupted by the commission attorney so that uh, he, and, and he later said they didn't want to hear what I wanted to say. Well, Bowers was uh, died on August the 9th, I believe, in an automobile accident two miles west of my town in Midlothian, Texas. And uh, I called the widow immediately and told her as soon as uh, uh, she felt like it, I wanted to talk to her about uh, this. And she said, well, no, my husband had been told not to talk about this, and so I'll have nothing nothing to say to you. And I, mm. I have called her again since then, but uh, uh, it appears there that that's one that will not talk to him. But there are dozens of others that... that uh, after a little coaching, after a little urging, might talk to us. Now, you, you list a number of, of what you call peripheral deaths in, as related to the assassination. Um, you have one chapter in which you, I believe, list Dorothy Kilgallen as one of those peripheral deaths. I wonder if you could explain that. I, I realize that Dorothy Kilgallen was a correspondent covering the Ruby trial for the New York Journal American, I believe it was, uh, and she made the contention that information uh, was furnished to Ruby's attorneys, uh, privileged information from, from the FBI or what have you, uh, as long as they would not raise the question or, or ask questions concerning uh, Oswald and the assassination per se. Is that a fair representation yes, of what Ms. Yes. Kilgallen said? Y yes, yes. I covered the, the Ruby trial, and uh, Ms. Kilgallen was there, I believe, two or, only two or three days. 
But while she was there, Judge Joe B. Brown, uh, after spending, after he invited uh, uh, Miss Gilgal into his offices, to his uh, chambers, and they spent an hour and a half uh, in a, during a recess in his chamber, just just the two of them, and then the judge came out and sent Ruby into the judge's chambers with Miss Kilgall, where they talked alone for, or they were in the room alone for 30 minutes. Now, she is the only news person who got this special privilege, and uh, you can check that by some of the other national commentators who were present, and they were mad as, uh, they <laughs> were quite angry because they were not uh, given this privilege. So, I contend that she is the only human being that has talked to Ruby alone in a room that was not bugged yes. uh, since he killed Oswald. And uh, then I think that it's uh, with her death, it seems that she should be included along with uh, Bill Hunter of Long Beach and Jim Cody of Dallas and Hank Kilgallum, who was killed over in Florida, and Whaley. Who I wonder if you could tell us just a uh, after we'll get back to Dorothy Kilgallen, but about Hunter, the person that was killed in Long Beach, who is that? Well, Bill Hunter was, is a Dallas native and was in Dallas at the time visiting his parents when uh, the president's visit, so he was covering uh, for his newspaper uh, when the president was killed and stayed on uh, uh, to cover over the next several days and came back to Long Beach and wrote a prize-winning account of, of uh, the assassination. And on Sunday afternoon, after Ruby had killed Oswald, Bill Hunter and uh, a longtime friend, Jim Cody, made an arrangement to meet with Senator in the apartment to which Senator and Ruby shared. Yes. Uh, there's one person present that I will not reveal his name because he, he claims he wants to stay alive, but... Bill Hunter and Jim Cody and Tom Howard and uh, George Senator went on a tour of the apartment talking and uh, what they talked about I don't know I wasn't present but I will say that Bill Hunter was uh, killed in the police station here in uh, in Long Beach shot to death by a policeman from what the report said to more than three feet uh, Jim Cody was killed uh, in his apartment in uh, Dallas uh, almost a year after the assassination and Tom Howard died uh, under rather peculiar, rather strange circumstances in Dallas of what the, the hospital said was apparently a heart attack. There was no autopsy. So three of those men uh, died. And and uh, I know that Hunter was working on the story, and I know that Jim Cody was associated with two other men in, working in, in preparing a book on the assassination. I see. And Cody's assignment was the was uh, the detailed study on the leaders in Dallas, and uh, what gives you the conviction? You 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 obviously have it. Uh, I'm not. I'm sure you you can't adduce proof. But what gives you the conviction that these murders or these deaths, I should say, peripheral deaths, are related? and that they are primarily related uh, to people who might give us information about the case. I suppose you're saying that it's self-evident in the testimony that you presented in the book. Is I think it's evident enough that uh, there should be some serious investigation. Now, there are only two people out of this 17 that are in their 60s, and when they're killed under these varied circumstances, uh, Whaley, the cab driver, was... Uh, apparently was hemmed up on the Trinity River Bridge. Now, Oswald was supposed to have traveled in Whaley's cab, right, is that correct? Right, right. Earlene Roberts was... Uh, His the, landlady. Well, not the landlady. She was the housekeeper, housekeeper for the landlady. See. at the, And she's the one who accepted uh, Oswald as a roomer at the rooming house. And she's the one who saw... Oswald, when he rushed back into his room, rushed through the hallway where Ms. Roberts was trying to tune the TV, rushed into his room for two or three minutes. And while he was in his room, a, Ms. Roberts said a Dallas police car drove up in front of the house and honked the horn. She said the horn went tit, tit. And when I thought she, that was a fascinating detail. Yes, yes I remember When she went to the door, to, she thought maybe someone was calling her because policemen had been coming by and talking with her. Uh, she even ventured uh, a she recollection gave, as to the numbers yes, that were on the Yes, they cars, pretty well I confused her on the numbers, but she gave uh, the names of the two officers who had been coming by to talk with her. 
She said one of them was, she thought was Officer Alexander, and then the other one was George Burnley. Well, now, the, I know of no newsman that talked to this lady after she gave that amazing testimony. She went into hiding, and, of course, she died before, uh, as far as I know, anyone in uh, of, a, of a newspaper career talked to her. Uh, she died before she was accessible to any, yes, any news Yes, yes. I see. And uh, I, I think... Uh, the commission was uh, remiss because uh, she said, I thought it was Officer Alexander. The commission didn't even ask her Alexander's first name. And then they misspelled Burnley's last name so that uh, we we can't find Alexander. And even if we go talk to Officer George Burnley on the Dallas Police Force, he can claim that it wasn't not me because that's not the way I spell my name. This, this happened so many times in the in the testimony and the exhibits that I think it, it is not uh, a mistake. I think uh, if we use the technology that, that has been developed, we could certainly find out whether or not questions were asked as to the correct spelling of many of these names, which may with, be important. I wanted to ask you, with reference to uh, the police car that uh, Earlene Roberts said she saw, I believe the commission maintained that there was no police car with uh, that particular uh, number on it. Do you feel that it was a police car or do you feel it was something else? She obviously saw something. I think everyone would agree to that. Is it, is it yes, a police car? Yes, I feel car? it was a police car. You do? Uh, yes, I feel it was a police car. I, I'm, I'm not sure whose car it was, of course, but I certainly feel that it was a police car. I think uh, the activities of uh, Officer Tippett and the fact that we now know that he was uh, sitting at the end of the bridge, or rather his car was sitting at the end of the bridge at a Gloco station in, in Oak Cliff, where he, and he was outside of the car observing traffic coming across from the assassination site. Now, Oak Cliff is, is um, to is the west, is it, and, and south of... South and west of uh, the assassination site. It's, it's a part of Dallas, but it's, uh, it's across the river is referred to as Oak Cliff. But in other words, you're placing him there within uh, what period of time with, after the assassination? Within, uh, I'd, within 20 minutes uh, after the assassination, 15 or 20 minutes after the assassination, because we we know from uh, the police radio logs that he moved immediately into the area. Why was he out of his uh, his area of competence, so to speak? Isn't, isn't that, am I correct in, in, in saying that, that he was... He was in an area where he he wasn't regularly patrolling. Yes, that's true, but they, there may be a good reason for that because of the the nature of the visit. They they were assigning people, had more people on duty that day, and uh, had him on on the outer limits of the city, uh, really south of the Oak Cliff area. And when the trouble happened, then they called him closer into the city as they call more and more policemen in, to the assassination site. But I, I I, think that the fact that he was there watching the traffic as it came from the assassination site, and then he rapidly drove away from that position uh, down Lancaster Street, and we don't know where he went from then, but he could, he could have been, although there were dozens of other police cars in the area at the time, he could have been the one who drove by the Oswald house and I think it's not too far out to assume that he might have been giving a signal by tipping the horn that way. Well, then what you're really saying is that you feel that not only was there a link between Oswald and Ruby, but you feel that there was a link between Tippett and Oswald. Yes, I think that uh, I know that uh, Oswald, I mean that Ruby and Tippett were very close friends, and uh, I know that uh, I feel very strongly that I cannot give you all of the. There is other evidence besides Carol Jarnigan that uh, Ruby and Oswald knew each other. And if they knew each other, then uh, Oswald and Tippett may have knew, known each other. I don't have any. Now, this question, on of that. course, was put to Oswald by the Chief Justice when he went to Dallas. You uh, mean by Ruby? Uh, the question was put to Ruby. Yes. As as to whether he had any knowledge or uh, any relationship with the. Uh, with T Officer Tippett, and he denied this at the time, although it wasn't a very satisfactory denial. I brought that testimony. I think we might turn to that now. Um, I think it's a, I think it's terrifying to read, and its uh, its implications. I, uh, the Chief Justice is is questioning Ruby, and 
Let me see if I can find the passage. Ruby is, is saying, unless you can get me to Washington, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not a crackpot. I have all my senses. I don't want to evade any crime I'm guilty of. Uh, but have I spoken this way when we talked? Uh, he continues, he says, unless you get me to Washington immediately, I'm afraid uh, after what Mr. Tonahill has written there, which is unfair to me regarding my testimony here. He says, you all want to hear what he wrote. Uh, what wonders, one wonders about this. Uh, do you feel that if, if uh, Ruby got to Washington, he, he would reveal things that he was reluctant to reveal in, in, in the Dallas jail where he was largely in the hands of his, his intimates, his old friends, the Dallas police? I certainly think that any criminal lawyer would feel that it's fair to assume that Ruby knew what he was talking about because Ruby uh, knew the police as no one else knows them. And I, I feel very strongly that the police uh, spent hours convincing Ruby that he ought to kill Oswald. And I, I can almost name the, the policeman. I think this uh, patrolman Olson, who spent hours with uh, Ruby on Friday night, and Belli said he also spent hours with uh, Ruby on Saturday night, and then uh, Chief Curry, a few weeks after the assassination and before the Ruby trial, Curry told uh, Olson that it would be best if he left the police force. And left, he left mm. the state, and Belli was not able to find him to have Olson to testify. And I, I certainly think that Jack Ruby should have been given the opportunity to go to Washington and tell whatever he had on his mind at that time, because I certainly I think he he may realize after he was so rudely. I think he really thought that he was going to be a hero when he killed uh, Oswald. And now that he's not, and he, he might someday tell us, but he's not going to tell us as long as he's in the Dallas jail. He, um, he asks Justice Warren, he says, are you staying overnight here, Chief Warren? And the Chief Justice replies, no, I have to be back because we have an early session of the court tomorrow morning. And uh, this seems to me amazing. Uh, I hope I'm not interpreting the testimony f uh, unfairly, but one has the impression after reading uh, the interrogation of Ruby in detail that uh, that they would want to get him to Washington. Of course, the question arises, were there any legal impediments that would have prevented uh, Ruby from being taken to Washington? He was uh, in custody in, in the Dallas jail. He was awaiting uh, trial on a murder charge. What What are the... Well, the commission had subpoena Legalism. power, and and I believe uh, if if uh, Ruby were willing to waive his extradition from the state of Texas, that uh, that uh, I don't see anything that would really impede his uh, trip to to Washington to to say whatever he wanted to say. There's so many things in in that uh, Ruby testimony uh, that's detrimental to the commission, and and that uh, shows I feel that that the commission uh, were remiss in, in their duty to their country. And one of them involves the testimony of uh, George Senator. Yes. Now, the commission just could not tell the story as Senator told it if they intended to stick to their uh, story that uh, Oswald did the job alone. Uh, and I refer to the Sunday morning meeting when... Uh, Senator was having breakfast in the Eatwell Cafe, and the news came over the radio that Oswald had been shot. Now, the commission in the report says that Senator, when he heard, said that Senator was not acting like a guilty man because when Senator heard that Ruby had shot Oswald, he jumped up and called his attorney. Well, now, that is not true. Senator said, when I heard... Oswald had been shot, I jumped up and called my lawyer. Hmm. When I heard five or ten minutes later that Ruby shot Oswald, I jumped in my car and went to the lawyer's house. Now, that's not the story that the commission told, and the commission knew they were not giving us the facts there because in the Ruby testimony, which from which you were just reading a few pages over, Ruby told them in his lie detector testimony that he told Senator he was going to kill Oswald. So the commission knew from Ruby's statement and from Senator's statement that their uh, review of Senator's activities were untrue, 
and I, I think it's a it's a justifiable uh, complaint against the commission and the staff or whoever is responsible for it. You feel they've misrepresented the testimony? It certainly misrepresents the truth. With reference to the polygraph test that was administered to Ruby, you have a chapter on that, as I recall, in which you... Uh, <laughs> You merely reproduce the the testimony uh, and the conversations between Ruby and Tonahill and others uh, with reference to the preparation of the questions that were going to make up the polygraph test. Yes. It seems to me incredible uh, that uh, that Ruby would be would be permitted to make suggestions or deletions uh, in what was to be asked. Ruby actually guided the questioning at times and and. Uh, I know from experience, when my place was firebombed, the police asked me... Now, was if, this in connection with your articles on the assassination? Or no, no, earlier? no, this was earlier. But I simply say that I know a little bit about lie detector tests since I took one. This was in 1962. And they do not, in the normal lie detector test, permit you to guide the questioning. Yes. And... Uh, this is this is amazing to me that we've got trained lawyers here who were conducting this uh, investigation, and they apparently know so little about the case that they permit their prisoner to direct the questioning. Well, didn't Ruby himself only last year, I believe it was in, in the spring uh, of 1965, didn't he cast doubts uh, on the um, polygraph test that was administered to him by saying to reporters when he was being taken from uh, his cell to the uh, the courtroom, he made several charges. First of all, he said there was a plot or a conspiracy uh, relating to the assassination that yes. was being covered up and that he was not permitted to talk. Yes. And at that time, did he not <laughs> say that Justice Warren had not made uh, uh, available the results of the uh, lie detector test. Is that correct? Yes, but of course, you see, uh, so many people say, well, he's just a nut. He's he's really off. Look at what he said. He, he's he's really a kook. But I, I, I do not think that we should jump to conclusions like that, particularly do I think so in view of the fact that during the Ruby trial, Senator's, uh, I mean, uh, Ruby's plea of insanity was rejected by the jury. And then just uh, last uh, spring, we had another sanity trial in Dallas where he was a judge sane. So I, twice now the courts have acted on his, uh, on his sanity, and I think that uh, in view of those actions, we must uh, proceed uh, by assuming that he is at this what? time sane and should pay some attention to the things that he has to say. I want to ask you, what do you feel is Ruby's fate? What lies ahead for him? Do you see... Uh, an eventual release for him, a long imprisonment no, or what? No, no, no. I, I have already made the prediction in print that uh, he will be killed, not uh, legally executed. I think that he's going to be murdered, uh, not in Dallas. They've had enough killings in Dallas, but I think that uh, someday he's going to be judged insane and will be moved out to one of the state insane asylums in some little town where he probably will meet his fate at the hands of maybe an enraged inmate. I don't this is certainly speculation, but uh, hmm. uh, that's that's the way I think. I think the man knows too much. I think he was very small in the conspiracy to kill the president. I look at this uh, conspiracy to kill the president as compared with a, a giant mosaic of, made up of thousands of threads. And I think that both Ruby and Oswald were very little men and maybe had only one thread to put in place in this mosaic. But I think that they were watched, they were carefully watched, to see that they put that thread in place at the time it was supposed to be put in place. I think uh, Oswald told the truth on... Uh, Friday night at 7.55 when he almost screamed to a bunch of reporters, I'm just a patsy. Well, that remark was uh, a cut out of uh, some of the television That's true. It was cut out, tapes. but uh, certainly it, uh, there's no it doubt that It has been that played he's... once since then. I believe a number of researchers have made... Well, it's in the audio. notes of Thayer Waldo yes. and, uh, uh, no, uh, Seth Cantor Seth and, Cantor and Waldo, the too. Scripps Howard that, uh, reporter. Yes. That, now, he uh, maintains that he saw Ruby at Parkland... Uh, uh, hospital shortly after the assassination. Uh, the commission discounts his testimony, even though there was a corroborating witness. Uh, 
it seems to me that there are strong arguments for his being there. Uh, that he saw Jack Ruby is what I'm yes, saying. Yes, I feel certain that Ruby was at the hospital. Will Matthias saw him, and uh, I was at the hospital, and I took pictures. Although I was almost uh, in a complete state of shock, I was snapping pictures of uh, just the area outside of the hospital, and I feel quite positive that I have a picture of Jack Ruby leaving Parkland Hospital. Every newsman in the Dallas area who has looked at that picture claims they also feel that it is Jack Ruby, but unfortunately... It is a picture from uh, the rear uh, uh, as Ruby is leaving the hospital. Well, there's another photographer by the name of Willis in Dallas who has uh, some photographs. Uh, The Willis uh, sequence uh, is published in one of the supporting volumes of of exhibits in the 26 volumes. And in one of those, it's alleged that that a... um, a person resembling Ruby is present outside the depository within a very short time after yes, the assassination. Yes. Do you believe that to be true? I believe the picture has been cropped. Yes. Uh, I, the main reason that I believe it's probably true is because the Warren Commission did crop it before they included it in their report. And uh, that's another uh, criticism that I have of the Warren Commission is that they, they would permit mutilation of of evidence this way. Or, well, and they this would... is what I wanted to get to, Mr. Jones, th- this question of whether the Warren Commission uh, merely did an, an inadequate job in the mind of critics or whether uh, some critics uh, can justifiably go farther and say there was a professional deformation of evidence. I I was reading through uh, some of the volumes just the other day with reference to uh, some material pieces of evidence. Um, Frazier, I believe his name is, uh, one of the FBI firearms experts, yes. um, has this testimony. I, I want to quote it to you, and I have some questions to address to you after I've, I've read it. He's speaking of uh, some of Governor Connolly's clothing. Uh, this is on page 65 of uh, volume 5. He says, I found in the cuff of the shirt, which is a French cuff, through both the outer and inner layers of the cuff, a hole which is ragged in contour, irregularly shaped, and which had more or less star-shaped tears extending outward from the hole into the material, located one and a half inches up from the end of the sleeve and five and a half inches from the outside cufflink hole, though both, as I said, through both layers of the cuff, and the hole was in such a condition possibly due to the washing of the material that I could not determine what actually caused it, or if it had been caused by a bullet, the direction of the path of the bullet with reference to entrance and exit. Now, it seems to me what he's saying there that, uh, Governor, that, that, that some material evidence in the case has been laundered. Uh, yes. I, uh, why I, and by whom? I, I think, uh, I think that, is, that is destruction of evidence. And I, I, not only did they permit the mutilation of evidence uh, by cropping of pictures and by the uh, tearing of the... Uh, Zapruder frames and gluing them back together, but they, they didn't even raise their eyebrows. Not a question was asked. About Has the commission the, replied to uh, to this at all? Have they made any? Uh, to my knowledge, they have not. They have not. But uh, th- this business, you know, in World War I, uh, they could uh, project the angle from which uh, the long-range artillery shells were coming into France by the scars on on the walls, and I believe that if the yeah, I believe that if the uh, clothing of Governor Connolly had not been cleaned and pressed and laundered, that we would have been able to tell a little bit about the angle of the bullet that hit Governor Connolly. And the commission didn't even bother to ask a single question about why the governor's clothing was cleaned and pressed. Where is the clothing and, now? I think it's in the uh, state of Texas archives, but as far as its value is, uh, is a, uh, it I no really I don't value know as evidence, but is, it, is it, what it certainly saying. has no more value as evidence because of the cleaning and pressing that it got. The next question that I want to ask is, uh, where do we go from here in terms of of the case? Um, I was reading in uh, the New York Times yesterday, the September 25th issue. There's an article on the editorial page by Tom Wicker. And uh, he's speaking of uh, a public discussion group in New York, uh, which recently uh, held a roundtable session about the Warren Commission report and its conclusion. And he points out that the major difficulty for the group was 
uh, finding anyone of stature who was willing to defend the Warren Report and its findings. And he, he makes a review of the evidence, and uh, he feels that uh, there should be a new investigation, or he's quoting people who feel that there, is a, there should be a new investigation. You've proposed such an investigation, yes. and uh, you've described the kind of investigation yes. it should be. Would you? Yes, well, of course, uh, my book is a compilation of a series of articles which appeared in my newspaper, and in the beginning I felt like that we should reopen the Warren Commission, uh, but uh, the further I got into this, I do not think that uh, reopening of the Warren Commission is the answer. I would like now very much to see a congressional investigation, uh, something similar to the congressional investigation after the Roberts Commission on the Pearl Harbor uh, yes. uh, incident, but uh, uh, I don't know. I, I hope that Congress will do it. I, I'm I'm critical of the president because uh, because uh, initially Congress uh, started steps toward an investigation of the assassination of well, the president. They initiated Initially, steps it, it for was, an investigation prior yes. to the, president of, uh, yes, the president's and, appointing a Blue Ribbon Commission. And then the, the president appointed this Blue Ribbon Commission, which really isn't a Blue Ribbon Commission at all except in name. These were the names of great Americans on, on this uh, commission. But in, in my opinion, in the eyes of history, the Warren Commission report will, will completely ruin Earl Warren in the eyes of history. You know, when they when the ship is sunk or, or the battle is lost, the captain has to take the blame. And uh, Chairman Earl Warren will have to take the blame for this thing, in my opinion, in the eyes of history. I, I, I really feel it would have been better with, if President Johnson coming to the presidency as he did should have just stepped aside and said, okay, I will let uh, Congress, you go ahead and investigate this thing, and if you need any power or any resources from uh, me, it's available to you. We've been talking to Penn Jones, Jr., the author of a new book called Forgive My Grief, uh, a critical review of the Warren Commission report of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Um, you were a, a general in the Army. You were a member of the Texas 36th Infantry Division, and you've uh, distinguished yourself in journalism. and. Uh, where do you go from here, Mr. Jones? You you have meetings at the Center of uh, Study for the Center of Democratic Institutions in S yes, Santa Barbara. Yes, I I, Bishop Pike has been very generous to invite us up, and so is uh, Mr. Scheinbaum, and I, I'm looking forward to it. That's the number one place I would like to visit in the state of in this great state of California is this study at uh, Santa Barbara. From there, then we go on to San Francisco for several. Uh, appearances and then from there to Denver where I will be talking on Sunday night and uh, on uh, Saturday. Well, Denver. we enjoyed visiting with you in Midlothian and uh, I was surprised and delighted that uh, you could take time out from your busy schedule while you're here in California to come and talk with us in the studio. Thank you again. Thank you, Bill, very much. This is Our Hidden History. <laughs> 